Good morning, good morning, good morning, everyone. It is Coffee Chats with Coach Candy, episode 108. Crazy to me. Uh, happy Friday, y'all. Uh, it is Friday of a short week, uh, which has also felt like a very long week. Uh, but grab your coffee, grab your juice, water, tea, whatever it is that gets you rocking and rolling. Good morning, Deborah. Happy Friday. Good morning, Sarah. Good morning, ladies. Let everybody take a minute here to jump on and get, uh, get settled in. As I get some caffeine in me. <laughs> Good morning, Tanya. Welcome back, my friend. Good morning, Martha. Good morning, everyone. Ooh, it is Finished Strong Friday. Uh, how's the week been? Good morning. Um, it's been, in my opinion, a very fast, long week for being a short week of only four days. That usually is what happens, I think, after a holiday weekend. Great morning. Excellent. Love it. Um, so happy Friday, y'all. We are on episode 108. Crazy, crazy, crazy. It just keeps flying by. Awesome, awesome. So for those of you that were here yesterday, you know I started to get into a little bit of my story about how I made the transition from corporate to the work that I'm doing now. And um, I shared a couple big <laughs> defining moments, uh, face plants, rock bottoms, whatever you want to call them, um, yesterday that were uh, good. Glad to hear it's been productive. That's awesome. Um, that were a little tough to share, uh, one in particular. Uh, I don't know if I've shared that story too often. Um, definitely not one of my uh, finest moments or highlight reels. And as you look back on all of those defining moments, um, <laughs> that one leg and all, hope you are recovering well, Tanya. I've been sending prayers to you for sure. I know it's a, a long process uh, back after uh, the surgery you had. So um, sending lots of love and light to you, my friend. And um, as we got into some stuff yesterday, I know um, I got into some pretty heavy stuff um, about some of my journey, uh, especially when I was kind of in the middle or an upward swing in my corporate career, uh, working 80 to 100 hours a week, really hitting burnout on all three levels, and then having two particular um, big moments, one where I ended up in the hospital thinking I was having a heart attack, and the other where I actually crashed my car into a um, guardrail, and both were huge wake-up calls for me to reclaim my life, right? To find a way to, to reclaim my voice and change something. So after both of those incidents happened, and I know many of you are curious, you know, what it took, what were the signs? And I think even yesterday as we were getting into some of the story when I talked about other people leaving, some of you were like, wasn't that a sign in itself? Yes. And there are signs, 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 you know, the song signs, signs everywhere. There's signs. Um, there are signs everywhere always. Um, oftentimes it's a matter of are we ready to receive them? Are we listening? Um, are we willing to take the courage uh, required when they show up? And so um, really what was going on with me, there were things that started all the way back from when I was 28 years old, all through my 30s, and then these two defining moments when I was at GE Healthcare. Uh, so that led me to a huge decision which was while I loved my job on some levels, while they dangled some carrots for me to go to to be able to do training at Crotonville and to have some of these really visible opportunities within the in the organization, I made a decision that it was time for me to leave. Um, the environment, the amount I was working, um, the pressure was just, it was wearing on me too much that it was costing me too many things in my life. And when we look at where the costs come from, right, um, it's in that space of what buckets are not getting full. And so we have the mental bucket, the emotional bucket, the physical bucket, the spiritual bucket, the energetic bucket and all of mine were depleted for sure so I ended up taking a job um, it was interesting because I was pretty clear I was gonna move away from Milwaukee then winters were also really hard for me and so it didn't help with uh, my state of mind or my my well-being at that time and so um, I started looking for things opportunities outside of Milwaukee and what had happened and I'll get on a whole nother conversation about the power of LinkedIn and why you should good morning Tanisha why you should be using LinkedIn um, because what had happened is I received a message um, from a recruiter at Northwestern Mutual saying they had a new position, they weren't posting it, they were reaching out to um, candidates they felt were qualified, and they thought I would be an ideal candidate to go through the process. And I was like, I know nothing about financial services, uh, insurance, any of that, and really wasn't interested at first, but I was like, all right, I guess I'm game, sure. 
<laughs> be careful what you respond to, right? And um, so what was interesting is I ended up having um, a series of interviews. And the first one, good morning, Paul. Hi. Um, the first one was an interview that I'd had with my soon-to-be new boss. And I remember we were on the phone, and I remember interviewing with her, and it was unlike any other interview I'd been on. And it was one that was really open, and we were supposed to have 20 minutes on the phone. It turned into, you know, over 90 minutes. And I remember her asking me a question at the end. She said, you know, on a scale of one to 10, what do you think about this job right now? And I said, I don't know what you're selling. I think that was exactly what I said. I said, I don't quite know what you're selling. I said, but I have to say, I'm like out of 15 right now. I feel like I should stay on the scale, but I have, I guess I really liked her. And so that led into a series of other interviews, one of them being what they call an emotional <laughs> an EQ interview, um, which is getting into, you know, your emotional intelligence. Well, as it turned out, and so all these signs show up, right? As it turned out, I had 102 temperature. I was sick with the flu when my interview came up. However, I did want to reschedule because it took us so long to get it on the calendar or whatever. I was like, you know what? This won't be that bad. Not thinking I'm going into my EQ interview. Probably turned out to be a blessing in disguise because I didn't have the capacity to put up the normal wall I would put up when some of the vulnerability questions and things showed up. And I remember just, I was just an open floodgate because I it took everything for me to be upright in that interview that I just was wide open. And I remember three days after that interview, I had a complete meltdown because I was like, oh my God, what did I say? Oh my God, I did not share that. I did not share that, which ended up after I turned got the job uh, it turned out to be the thing that that Sharon really coached me on and I remember her saying at one point to me you know Candy you're a phenomenal leader you have this ability to to draw people in to lift them up and you would be a far more effective leader if you would let people see your vulnerability well I came from environments where vulnerability was seen as a weakness I came from environments where you absolutely didn't share your you know your yourself wide open and so this was like very foreign to me and uh, needless to say I worked with her for three years Years. and she completely changed the way I get to show up I really do believe a lot of the work I do now is a testament to being able to be led um, by her and to be on her team and to be with the colleagues that I had on what we were given opportunity to do she truly opened me up very differently as a leader which I in turn got to do with my teams as well and um, what happened was um, when she left um, her mom had passed away before right before her 40, 40 birthday and um, she decided that it was time for her to take an exit so that she could spend more time with her family it really rocked my world and I was like wow if she's leaving she's I mean she was the next VP on the, the docket and we were right behind her right and um, it was one of those that you're like wow she's gonna leave maybe I should consider things right and so I went from working for her and my VP who gave me full reign I mean I've never had such a wide open space to lead in my entire corporate career and it was it was amazing it was amazing what I got to create in that space when she left the person that replaced her was extremely micromanaging and I felt like I was right back in the environment I had come from um, that had knocked me down. And what's interesting is when you have those defining moments or when you have those rock bottoms and when you allow yourself permission to remove yourself from that cycle of toxic um, energy, from that abuse. And truthfully for me, I had a recognition when I was at GE that all of the abuse I had growing up especially my relationship with my dad that all I was doing was recreating those environments in my professional career too because when I was at Johnson Controls it was just as bad I, I was working for le managers I'll say I won't even call them leaders I was working for people who were very um, micromanaging very um, more from a scarcity mentali mentality was the way that they chose to run their teams, right? Um, I used to tell myself I was the human punching bag. And you remember the, the analogy I like to use is, do you remember those blow-up punching bags? When, especially those of you that are, you know, my fellow Gen Xers, you know, growing up, we had those big blow-up punching bags, right? You'd throw a punch, and that thing would, like, fall back and kind of wobble and pop back up. And so you'd sit there, and you'd keep punching that thing, and, and it would, like, take longer to come up because the air started to go out of it. And you either punch it until you got tired or you would punch it until it actually popped and I felt like I was the human punching bag in most of my corporate career and I had this huge epiphany as I was making the transition from GE to Northwestern Mutual which was what if I stopped putting myself in environments 
where I was a human punching bag? What if I took ownership to say, that's no longer okay for me to be in those environments? So I literally went from an environment like that to you know sh change 180 degrees to an environment that was really nurturing and really different. And people went home and spent time with their families and like the office was empty by six o'clock at night. And it was crazy. Now the culture, good morning Ruben, the culture would shift a little bit as I was there. And so to be in that environment, to be wide open, to have somebody that saw your potential as a leader and allow you to step into that and then to go right back into a culture and environment from what you just came from, um, for me that wasn't okay. And so I ended up taking a lateral move into a different department, which when I took the position, um, I took a bit of a risk because I took a contract position instead of staying on as a full-time employee um, with the company. I still have my benefits and everything else. However, I took an 18-month um, contract, which I had several people coach me and say, you know what, Candy, that's awfully risky. If there's not a job for you after this contract's done, you won't have a job here. And I said, don't worry, I'll figure it out. And what was interesting is that was the start of a series of signs, additional signs that showed up that helped me finally make the decision, good morning Jan, finally make the decision to walk away. And so while I was at Northwestern Mutual, I was also the person responsible at one point for bringing in coaches and trainers and speakers. It's one of the reasons why I help people in terms of how to get corporate engagements. I know both sides of it. I know how to get in there as an entrepreneur and I'm the person that used to um, run those budgets, invite those people in, go through the screening process, all of that. Um, and it was interesting to me when I would watch some of the people come in, the consultants, the trainers, the coaches, and I would hear their message, which oftentimes was very diluted and there was no integration, no accountability. And so that was already starting to plant a seed for me on why are we spending this money when there's no way we're setting ourselves up to get a return on that investment. We do our rah, rah, rah on Thursday, Friday, and then come back Monday, it's the same shit as always, and people regress back. Because if they do work like I do, which opens people wide up, wide up or wide open, um, then they're left hanging there going, oh my God, I said this in front of my boss, I said this in front of my colleagues, and they have this fear that shows it, and so they, and then they actually regress back and like retreat more um, and contract in that space. Good morning, Carol. And so it was interesting because I was already starting to find this sense of frustration on how are we supposed to get a return on investment? We weren't moving the needle forward. It felt like it was a lot of lip service and not a lot of traction. And so it's interesting because they tell you oftentimes when you're trying to step into your purpose. Again, purpose is not something that's out there. Purpose is already who you are. One of the ways to start to understand the signs that show up for your purpose is is what are your hot buttons? What are the things that piss you off? And this was one of those things that was starting to really get under my skin in corporate. It was really starting to torque me off was that we were spending, we were wasting this money to check a box that said that we were doing professional development, that we were growing our teams when we weren't doing anything to help them integrate. We weren't doing anything to hold them accountable. We weren't doing anything to even measure progress after that like blast of rah, rah, rah. And it was really starting to seed something inside of me it's still a hot button for me and it actually has become a powerful negotiation strategy for me when I go back into corporate it has become a conversation that I'm willing to have good morning Robin because I know it's not happening across the board and it changes the game it stops people from looking at me as a vendor and they start to look at me as a strategic partner because I'm having a bigger conversation about return on investment and opportunity costs right okay so I'll share that a little bit later so what happened was that seed's already starting to plant, right? And so I move into a new position. It's a position that was just honestly in my just open assessment, big waste of time. It was a big waste of resources for the company. It was this chase our tails, do a bunch of check the box exercise and look like we were creating something that was actually moving forward. Um, and what was interesting is um, at the same time as all this was going on, um, for those of you that know, I had a very difficult relationship with my dad. Um, in fact, I had not spoken to him 15 years prior to his death. He passed, um, when I was at Northwestern Mutual, uh, right now it's been, what, nine, nine years um, since he passed. And when he passed, I was fine with his passing because I had already made my peace with him not being part of my life. I had no regret in that space. And when I moved into this new position, though, it was about two years later, I started to struggle with the fact that when he passed, 
effectively nobody really cared. There wasn't a lot of, there wasn't a lot of mourning. I mean, my brother and sister and I got together and had our own stuff to deal with. Um, his own family, he came from an Italian family, was kind of like, eh, a little candle in the church. Eh, what goes around comes around. These were actually what his brother and sister had said and done. And there was nothing. We had no services. His his eulogy when it was written, um, or the write-up in the, I guess, what is it even a eulogy? It was just the, the announcement um, from the wherever it just basically said his name that he was the son of my grandparents and then he had three kids there was nothing in there there was nothing of meaning that signified any kind of real impact he had in his life and there was something about that that i was going through some of these transitions myself as i was feeling stuck at morning barb i have to say i went through a very dark period um i went through a period where it really, I, I felt really challenged in the fact that somebody could have almost 62 years on this earth and didn't feel like they significantly impacted anything. Now, in hindsight, I can say there was a huge impact on what it left for me, my brother, my sister, in that space, and I get that. At the time, I didn't. At the time, I was struggling with the fact that somebody was here on this earth and that they didn't, there, there was no, there was no impact. There was no, there was no legacy. There was no anything. And this was a human being that couldn't love himself, let alone put that love out into the world, right? And so I really struggled. And I remember I sent an email out um, to my core group of people, and I said, I right now, because I started to hit another rock bottom. I went into a really dark place trying to understand this, and I was going through all this transition with my the leader above me leaving all this kind of tumultuous stuff happening internally and I started to spin a little bit and um, as right before I made the transition over to the lateral move all this started to kind of percolate at the same time and so I was having to deal with my vulnerabilities and my triggers and my traumas in a whole different way and I remember sending an email out to my core group and said I don't know what's going on right now all I know is I need to ask you all to keep your distance right now I can't be your rock I can't be your shoulder I can't be what you need because I was I was everybody's champion rock shoulder I'm the empath I've always been the person that's held the container for everyone and at this point I knew I needed to go deep and it wasn't until just recently that I realized why that happened the way it did I am an external thinker and a very 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 internal emotional processor so I'm an extreme extrovert when it comes to thinking ideas out loud and I'm an extreme introvert when it comes to dealing with my own vulnerabilities and, and emotions and I understand that now I didn't then all I knew is I didn't want anyone around me I didn't want anyone to ask me what was going on I needed to do my work and um, it was a six-month period where I was really in this space and I, I would say it wasn't a burnout space I would say it was in a really it was in a space of not knowing who I was not knowing what my value was um, it was a space where I felt very lost and uh, in fact uh, for any of you that have read my book the prayer that I put in the beginning of the book um, was the prayer that I created to help me get through that six month period because I remember going to bed and I, I pretty much cried myself to sleep every night for six months that I would have a conversation with God which is my higher power whatever yours is whatever you believe in um, and I would simply say I gave everything I could today and I still don't know I, 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 I'm exhausted I'm tired I don't know what to do and I would just cry and say I'm gonna do it again tomorrow and I'm so grateful for this journey right now because I recognize because I got to a point in my life where I realized that every time I hit kind of rock bottom, it's such a gift. And I remember someone telling me, honor the journey, right? Honor the gift inside of the struggle. And I just simply said, know that I have so much gratitude because I know wherever this is leading me is in a place I can't even like imagine right now. And six months that happened. In the course of that six months, good morning, Terry, good morning, Anne, my uncle, who I was extremely close to, my mom's brother, got extremely ill. He ended up um, having liver and bone cancer. Um, he was already diagnosed with AIDS um, many, many years uh, prior and um, was hospitalized immediately. He lived in San Diego. I picked up everything because um, I was able to work um, remotely 
um, with the, the job I was doing at Northwestern Mutual, I picked up everything and I went out to San Diego and I was his caretaker for 12 days. Um, I was at, he was in ICU the entire time. Um, and I was his caretaker, um, which he wouldn't even let the nurses do things. So like things that I never, cause I don't even like hospitals. I can get into a whole talk about that. Um, so this is so out of my comfort zone. And this was a space that my uncle needed me to be. He was someone that I went and spent time with a couple times a year. I would go to San Diego. It was my second home. And, um, there was something magical. And so this is one of those signs that showed up. Oh, thank you, Carol. I appreciate that. I'm still processing similar emotions. My mom's passing two years ago. The inner emotional process is very true for me. I guess that's why people see us as warriors and have it all together when we're still struggling internally. Yeah. And there's, you know, one of those things, Carol, I'll offer you inside of that is the journey's never over. I actually had a constellation work where I had an epiphany in that constellation, just as a quick side note, um, where all of a sudden I had this space where I'm like, oh my God, this story with my dad is never going to end. And then there was a shift in my constellation that I realized, oh my God, this story with my dad is never going to change, and it's part of why I do the work that I do. Um, for those of you that know, when I was in Vancouver and got to release my attachment to my family's, you know, history and legacy and the generational trauma that's gone on in my family, I thought my role, because as I stepped out of this space with my dad, dealing with my dad's death, watching my uncle transition from life into his next phase, and I have to say, there's something quite beautiful and I know that sounds weird there's something quite beautiful when you get to witness someone you love transition into that next space and know that you were there um, to witness that and so for me there was a healing that happened being by my uncle's bedside that allowed me to re release myself from that six months of hell that I was in. And what was interesting is I stepped away from that thinking, oh my God, it's not just my legacy I need to create. I need to create a legacy on behalf of my family. And that was my journey for the last 10 years until this year when I was in Vancouver and realized I don't need to carry the weight of all the wrongs that my family has done into the legacy that I'm creating. It has brought me to this point. It was a story I needed to get me here. And in order to do the next level of work that's being asked of me to step in my purpose, it was the opportunity to release my dad and the rest of my family and ask them to take their stuff back. Which, and I say that, Carol, because you will have moments where that just keeps showing up to help you move into your next level. And so when I had that show up in my constellation, it was one of those where I was like, oh my God, this is part of my story for my life. I chose this path. If you believe anything that Wayne Dyer says, we choose our parents. Our, our childhood, and I, I, I've said this before, God gave us our childhood so that we would step into our purpose. When we understand that we, I, I feel like I chose the path that I had so that I could do the work that's being asked of me. There's so many gifts in that, right? And it's taken me a long time to be able to say that. I, I, I to the, Today, I would tell you my dad is one of the biggest blessings I ever had in my life um, and continues to be a blessing in my life. Um, for all, I would wish any of my childhood or my relationship on another person. I wouldn't wish that on another person and I wouldn't be who I was without it. And so, so much gratitude and, and just recognize the gift. And as my uncle transitioned out of that, I was like, oh my gosh, there's something more. And so I started to get this, good morning, Chris. I started to get this space where I started to get really antsy. I'm like, there's something bigger. I, and I remember having a conversation with Sharon, the leader who really opened me up at one point, when she said, you know what, Candy, you have this energy. You can walk in a room and lift people up, or you can walk in a room and shut them down and without saying anything. And you need to be really responsible for that energy. And I was like, that's not fair. I didn't ask for this. This was, mind you, a couple years before I hit this, this defining space. And she goes, you know, for someone who keeps saying that your purpose is so big and that there's something out there for you, maybe if you cut the BS going on in your head, you'd see that it's standing right in front of you. And I remember her saying that, and somehow that came back to me when I came through um, that period about dealing with my dad, my uncle transitioning, and then what happened was incredibly powerful. There were three very powerful signs, and I'm a very big believer. Three is one of my very big spiritual numbers. There were three signs that came up within a month's period, and they were like so succinct. And it happened after I came to Austin. 
um, to uh, my sister's best friend was getting married and I'd visit Austin many times and I'd had my list of five of where I was going to move because I was very clear it was time for me to leave quick corporate. I knew that. And I'm like, hell, I'll move. I'll go somewhere. I'll take a sabbatical. It doesn't matter. I didn't, I just, I knew I had to like make a change in my life. And uh, I came down to Austin and it was like, we were at the wedding and I'm like, I don't know why, but Austin's just speaking to me. And the minute I let Austin drop in, these three signs showed up like bam, bam, bam. So that was March of 2013. And I came home and I'm like, oh my God, I'm moving to Austin. This is crazy. Austin has never been on my radar. I don't even know if I want to live in the same city as my sister because that has not always gone well. Um, oh my God, but Austin is, is speaking to me. And I'm like, well, I guess I'm moving. And as soon as I said I was moving to Austin, like everything opened up. And it's amazing when you own the signs that show up, how easy the rest of the process gets. And so that was mid-March. Over the course of mid-March to April, <laughs> um, middle of April 2013 these three things happened so I started to like put job things out there and I was like looking at nonprofits looking at I got plenty of job offers and every one of them just made me feel sick to my stomach I'm like nope don't want to keep working in the financial services industry nope don't want to have to be doing this right and um, so then I was like, you know what, maybe I, it's not about finding a job right away. I've worked for 20 years in corporate. I don't have kids. I don't have anything. I have so much in my retirement fund and saved away and whatever. I mean, I've made a lot of money and I'm not spending it. And maybe I just take a sabbatical and invest in me and figure it out along the way. Holy crap, that gave me permission. So then what happened was first I got together um, and had lunch or dinner with a former friend of mine from, or not former, a uh, former a uh, classmate of mine from MSOE who was a friend of mine I hadn't seen since we graduated. She was my old RA. She is like one of my heroes. Not only is she a biomedical engineer, she in fact now she just took a position as chief of surgery for the Air Force up in Milwaukee. She flies F-16s. The woman is my hero. And we were talking about it because she was sharing with me what it was like to go through the training to fly an F-16, which by the way, the torture training she and her team have to go through, especially with her being a woman. Um, was I don't know how anybody survives that because they really have to put you through the worst of the worst because what will happen is they will torment the team of a woman even more so than the woman because it's it's one of those spaces where they think that's the weak link and so the like the torture training she taught me talked to me about I, I'm just like blown away and I'm, I, I was telling her I said you are so my hero and she's like are you crazy you inspire me so much you've always been my hero and I was just kind of like I don't understand that and I remember her making a comment to me, and this was sign number one. She said, you know, my mom asked me why I put myself in these situations and why I want to fly F-16s and fighter jets. And she goes, I remember, she goes, I told my mom, because every time I get in that plane, it's like my feet don't touch the ground and my heart dances. And I remember feeling like the air got knocked out of me because the question that just kind of like came washing over me was, Candy, when's the last time you felt your heart? dance and I couldn't let it go when she said that everything lit up in me and I started to go through this process of man what makes my heart light up right what makes it dance and so I'm just looking Carol true on the journey beautiful gift to be with one you love is the transition absolutely I'm hearing you Robin beautiful share candy everyone headed out have a great day Robin great weekend um, you as well I'm about to give back baggage to a family member that I've been carrying around for 20 plus years I feel relief having made the decision fear the conversation and how I expect him not to take it back um, just find leaving the baggage on the sidewalk as well. Lots of love and light to you, Terry, um, as I know what you're going through right now. Um, and so that sign showed up that first moment. Fast track about a week, and I'm out having dinner with friends of mine at Screaming Tuna in Milwaukee, one of my favorite places. And um, I, I walk in and I recognize this girl. This girl looks very familiar and happens to be a person at the time who was managing Screaming Tuna. And all of a sudden I hear this Candy Barone. And I was like, yes. Yeah. She goes, do you remember me? Um, and I was like, you look so familiar. And she's like, she told me her name. And I just stood there shocked. Because for those of you that remember when I told the story about Tony, when I did the, the school to work program, when I was at Johnson Controls, and I did this whole Aspire, Adapt, Achieve, I had a group of students that were inner city kids that were you know, going to Brown Deer School District. And I got to work with them on soft business skills. I got to work with them on building out this internship program so that they could see opportunities in engineering, technology, accounting, different things for them um, and it was a four-year program and this was my baby this was my project right and uh, 
really loved this program and it was right when I was fighting with my demons and you know I had one of my first rock bottom moments when um, everything with Tony happened and his mom had told me I had saved his life and all of those things so for those of you that were here and remember that um, this was one of those students um, in that program and she's like you know what are you doing now and I was telling her where I was working and what I was doing she's like oh I'm so surprised and I said why do you say that and she said we I always thought you would do something more like what you did with us she goes and I'll never forget her saying this this was 12 years after I did this program um, she said to me, she goes, do you know that some of us still get together and talk about what you did and how you impacted our life? Sign number two. And I, I went home and I remember thinking, holy cow, that so lit me up being able to open up possibilities for, for others, right, these students. And so then I had this epiphany. I'm like, you know what, if I'm going to move, if I'm going to do this, then the, the mover's going to charge by pound. I need to just start cleaning and purging and, and putting things out. So she triggered me to just say, okay, I want to go through some of these old things that I put together. So I started going through my file cabinets, and I picked a Sunday um, – uh, afternoon and I started to purge through things and at the same time it was right around well actually the first sign that showed up I forgot was mid-March when we got our um, pay statements and our bonuses uh, at Northwestern Mutual and it was one of those where you get merit and variable pay and you get whatever and I got an E rating which I don't even know how because I feel like I didn't show up um, I was in a role that didn't have wasn't defined I felt like I didn't know what I was doing and I ended up with effectively about a 19% raise between merit and variable and I remember telling a friend um, I'm like oh my god all I want to do is crawl under my desk I don't even feel like I deserve this or showed up for this she's like didn't you just say you got a really nice raise I'm like great yeah that's more money in my bank account so that was the other sign that showed up inside of that mid-March um, that started this. So what happened was I was going through these papers. It was a Sunday. It was like April 10th or something on uh, 2013. And I'm going through all these papers. And I ended up with this pile that started to show up that was about like this. Um, and the very last piece of paper that I put on top of that pile was that yes philosophy that I come up with when I worked at GE and I had left for the nonprofit and I went to bed that night going I don't know why but I feel like I'm gonna get told exactly what I'm supposed to do this week I had a call with a mentor of mine uh, Kevin on Monday because he was trying to bring me down to uh, Austin to be his C chief development officer for his office and uh, we started having a conversation and as we were having the conversation I remember saying to Kevin oh my god and it was just like it was it just dropped in it was Monday night, right after I'd done that purge, and it was one of those that was, oh my God, yes isn't a program I'm supposed to build while I'm in corporate, yes is who I am. And like every part of my body lit up, and it was like this, this just epiphany, and then I started to cry. And I remember Kevin, who also was this amazing person who gifted me the book, The Traveler's Gift by Andy Andrews. And chapter six in that book is one that has forever sat with me, and it's called Having a Decided Heart. And I remember Kevin saying to me, Candy Barone, my friend, you have a decided heart. And I just started to cry. And it was amazing because that week I knew what it was I was supposed to do. And I started my first certification program for coaching. I started my first website. I bought my MacBook Air. I started my first uh, business card. I had all of that within that first week. And then I sat there and went, oh, I can't say anything for another month because I'm this close, this close to my five-year pension and I'm not walking away from that. So I sat with it by myself. I told nobody, nobody for a month. And the day after my five-year vesting point, I walked into HR and handed over my papers. And I remember them saying, well, that was well played. I'm like, I'm not stupid. And I gave two weeks. I left corporate May 31st of 2013. I was in Austin June 13th, 2013. And I established my LLC August 1st. That is the power when you watch the signs and I've never looked back. And I am going on. I passed you know, I'm now six years in my business going into my seventh year. And uh, that is the opportunity when those signs drop in. And so that's for some of you that are like, how did you make this? How did you know? It was listening to the things that kept showing up. It was seeing the um, space that was lighting me up. And it was recognizing when something got the hair on my arms to stand up or my heart to start to race. Um, it was powerful. And um, once I made one decision, 
it just was a series of decisions after that. And the first decision was I was moving away from Milwaukee. It was time for me to move. I let the rest of it fall into place. I didn't have to have it all figured out in one fail swoop. And that's the thing for some of you that are struggling with, oh, allow yourself to make the first decision. Whatever is showing up, yes or no, ask yourself because that in itself is such permission to let other things drop in. Uh, Martha, thank you so much. Uh, Terry, I am so good at compartmentalizing to handle tough situation and other people's needs. I often forget to go back and compart to that compartment that holds my emotions and just leave them and just leave them there stacking them up. I recently realized that about myself and decided to become intentional about my emotional processing, not just stuffing it away as I move to the next thing. I don't love I don't love that all the way. Yeah, it's not easy for sure. E equals a, a, a. Um, love that book. Yes, that book is amazing. And I kept asking when you were going to leave. <laughs> You're right. Yes, she did. I, Terry and I worked together at that time. Um, it was very clear. Kathy, welcome. Good morning. Oh, you're so welcome. Um, thank you. And I appreciate that. And I feel the same way. Um, I've gone back and been able to tell some of that story, even in the same corporate spaces. I've done training back at GE at Northwestern Mutual. It's amazing um, how that story is something, you know, talking about reclaiming yourself, stepping into a different role of leadership. And all of that is because these things were gifts, right? And so all of the rock bottoms, all of the, the stuff that felt like, you know, the shit storm that was never going to end has all led me to this beautiful place. And it hasn't always been an easy ride by any means. Um, it's not easy being an entrepreneur. And I feel like Kermit songs going on in the back of my head. It's not easy being green. It's not easy being an entrepreneur. Um, that being said, I have no regrets. And it's been the best thing that I could have done and it was trusting my intuition it was listening to the whispers within that kept showing up based on different signs that were given to me and so for some of you that are really trying to figure out what your next move is trying to understand if there's the next transition for you I'm going to suggest that you get quiet I'm going to suggest that you allow yourself to sit in the spiral to sit in the shit storm to sit in the space that feels the ickiest because the only way you're going to get in is if you honor the struggle, if you honor the space. If it's all, if it's too easy, you're probably not going big enough. And so it needs to be that space that scares you a little bit or scares you a lot. Um, and I still remember that I came down here and I was like, oh my God, now what am I going to do? I'm here. I did this decision. And I'm like, well, you kept saying you were going to write a book. So now's the time better than ever. And I sat down and wrote my first book. I wrote my book in July. I edited for two months. It was out by Thanksgiving. And that started what? became some of my speaking engagements, some of my programs, because I started to look at what can I control, what keeps speaking to me, and I, I still do that. I'm like, show me what the next space is. Show me that I need to show up on Facebook Live and have these conversations. Show me where I need to be um, sharing this message, and I just listen. And now it's an opportunity to respond, um, to get into that space. That's a skill, learning to listen to your inner voice. What a blessing. Absolutely, it takes practice. And if you're constantly running the hamster wheel, if you're constantly in motion, I guarantee you will never hear those whispers. You need to give yourself space to just be and be still. And that means you need to schedule time on your calendar to fill your cup first. That means you need time to meditate, to journal, to just be, to stare at the wall, to do something that allows you to play. If you are not putting that time first for yourself, you are depleting yourself always before you can figure out what you need to fill your cup um, so that you can serve at another level. So I just, I offer that, that um, if you do feel like, wow, that's so hard, you probably need to carve out that time. And as Tony Robbins says, if you cannot find 10 minutes for yourself, then you need to schedule an hour. And I, I believe that to the core. If you don't know how to be still with yourself for 10 minutes, then you need to start practicing an hour and get really comfortable. The more you give yourself that space, the more will drop in, the easier the process, and the more you can say no to all of the peripheral noise that's getting in your way. Because it became very clear, I had to say no to a lot of different things. One being the security of getting another J-O-B and allowing myself to create my own path or allow myself to respond to the path that was opening up for me. So hopefully that gives you guys um, a little bit of insight into the journey that I've taken. Again, I appreciate you allowing me to be um, open and vulnerable with you. Um, sometimes it's not easy to talk about our stories, right? And we never know who can relate or who can pull a piece of that uh, with them 
when um, we do share. So I hope you will find the right people to share your stories with. I hope you will see that everything on your journey, everything in this lifetime is happening for you. It's not happening to you. And it's all about how you choose to um, view from what perspective, um, because you can either play victim and play the martyr and play the role of, oh, in this life, everything's happening to me. Or you can say every aspect of what's showing up in my life is something for me. And the, the, the stickier, the ickier, the, 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 the bigger, the harder, um, usually means the more transformational and the more beautiful on the other side. And so honor that place to know that you are being given everything you need to get to your next level. And when you honor that, when you embrace that and say yes to yourself in that process, um, amazing things show up on the other side. And so I feel so blessed and honored um, to be on the other side of that and there are still things I keep transitioning through. So um, you are all so welcome. Um, have a fantastic Finish Strong Friday. Have a amazing and wonderful and powerful weekend and uh, I will see you all back here on Monday morning, 7.30 Central Time. Um, in the meantime, I'm sending you all heart to heart hugs and um, give yourself space to be with you to listen a little bit to the whispers within. With that, I love you and I'll talk to you soon. Have a great weekend, everyone.